Good morning. Today's message is titled The Lord's Supper and Etiquette at the Lord's Supper. Now let me start out the message with a humble request. Some of you may not agree with everything I say and I don't ask you to accept anything I say because I said it. I have no authority apart from the authority of the Word of God. All I request of you is that you will be good Bereans and Thessalonians. Well, you might then say, what do you mean by that? Well, you find that if you read Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it says that the saints in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So we see that the Bereans were very diligent in how they searched the scriptures. Now the same Thessalonians who failed in Acts chapter 17, Paul says to these people in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's all I request of you and want of you to be today. No matter how much you agree with me or disagree with me, read the word of God and then take your belief and compare it against the word of God and ask yourselves the question, is this right or is this wrong? If I am wrong, then get your evidence from the word of God and show me my error and I will change my mind. If you are wrong, then change your mind about the same. It's also my humble request to the elders of this assembly that if whatever I state is something publicly which I state today, if something is wrong or is not in line with their understanding of God's word, then they should correct that which is stated publicly. Why publicly? Well, because I preached publicly and we do not want the congregation misled in any way, shape or form. So a public correction is the right thing to do because the message was given publicly. A hush-hush correction does not do anyone any good, especially the congregation who got misled by the erroneous teaching. No, I would not be offended in any way, shape or form, because what is there to be offended? I see nothing to be offended about when the correction is shown directly from Scripture. You see, the elders have a God-given responsibility to shepherd the flock in the right way, and unless you correct the errors, how is anyone going to learn? I rather see it as a learning opportunity and I rather prefer to be corrected than to continue in my erroneous thinking which will only compound the error even further in the future. You see the elders responsibility is first and foremost God word and then man words. During this message I shall go from the usual pattern of message delivery and so sometimes during this message I'm going to be posing questions to myself that some have either asked me privately or I myself have entertained at some point of time and I shall try and provide the answers to those questions so that we get a better understanding of this topic. With that in mind, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the best known chapter on the Lord's Supper. Paul is writing to the Christians at Corinth. Now we shall be reading from beginning at verse 23. The Apostle Paul is painting the scene here and the occasion was the night of Jesus' betrayal and it was the eve of his death. It's a deeply moving scene as the Lord Jesus Christ is gathered with his disciples for what has come to be known as the Last Supper. It was on the night of the Jewish Passover and that is when the Lord Jesus introduced something entirely new. 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, goes this way, for I, what, for I have received of the Lord that which I have also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till I come. Now the Lord will bless the public reading of the Holy Scriptures. The Lord's Supper 
is also known in Christendom as the Remembrance Meeting or the Remembrance Feast. It's also known as the Breaking of Bread. Some denominations call it the Eucharist, which essentially means Thanksgiving. Since he gave thanks for the elements, you'll find that in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 to 23, and in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, and verse 27. In some denominations, this feast is also called the Communion. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, it's called the Communion, because there is a common sharing or fellowship with Christ and with one another as we partake of the bread and the wine. Now, one prominent denomination calls it the Mass. I personally prefer to call it the Lord's Supper, because that is the exact name given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 20, and for the simple reason that it is the Lord Jesus who had convened it, and he is the principal guest of honor at that meeting. My alternate preference would be to call it the breaking of bread, as it is mentioned as the breaking of bread in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 and in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. In a nutshell, the Lord's Supper is to remind believers of his body given and his blood shed for their salvation. That is what the Lord's Supper is all about in its simplicity and its very essence. Now here are the facts about the Lord's Supper as revealed in Holy Scripture. Fact number one, in the Gospels, we have the institution of it by the Lord Jesus himself. Fact number two, in the Acts, we have the celebration of it by the early disciples providing us with a very clear pattern. Fact number three, in the Epistles, we have the explanation of it by the Holy Ghost with full directions as to the manner of its observance till the Lord's return. How simple all this makes it. If the Lord has spoken, it is ours to hear. If he has given commandment, it is ours to obey. So first question, let us ask ourselves this question. Who may participate at the Lord's Supper? Well, if you read Acts chapter 2 and verses 41 and 42, it paints a very clear order or pattern and tells us who may participate in the Lord's Supper. It says, Then they that gladly received his word. So we see here, it is for believers who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is for believers. Then in the same verse you find, Then they were baptized. So we see that the, these believers who had put their trust also obeyed the Lord in the waters of baptism. And then the verse continues and says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, If you're a born-again Christian believer, the Lord's Supper is going to be something which is very precious for you. Only born-again Christian believers will enjoy the Lord's Supper because it is in remembrance of me. That is what the Lord Jesus said when he instituted the Lord's Supper. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. It is a remembrance feast. Scripture tells us that the disciples who began to break bread in memory of him after he was risen. And so when we state this affirmatively in a nutshell, all who confess the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and all who have a walk which is consistent with that faith, should be welcome to the Lord's Supper. Now, born-again Christian believers gather together to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. You'll find that it is a weekly remembrance meeting. It is not once a month, not once a year. Rather, it is weekly, every Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day is the first day of the week. And that is what the Lord's Supper is all about. It is the first experience of the Christian. Now, I'd like to say that the Lord's Supper is the prime target for the enemy. There is no meeting in the assembly that the enemy hates more than the Lord's Supper. You know why? Because the Lord's Supper is designed to give all the glory to God.
and the devil hates that. The devil wants to take the glory away from God and that has been his goal through endless ages. The Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper brings all the glory to God and Satan, the enemy, hates it. Consequently, the enemy has been able to shroud the Lord's Supper in many divisions and denominations of Christendom with superstition and cold ritualism. Yet one, when one reads the Bible carefully, we find that the Bible clearly indicates that the Lord's Supper is a simple remembrance meeting. Let me repeat that again. The Lord's Supper is a simple remembrance meeting and it is for the Christians to experience it. It's a weekly remembrance meeting. Alas, we find that in Christendom it is sometimes kept only monthly. Sometimes it's only observed twice a year and sometimes even once a year. And sadly, there are some that don't even bother to keep it at all. Now, there is one prominent denomination in Christendom. You'll recognize it when I talk about it. They call it the Mass. They say that their Mass, which to us believers is the Lord's Supper, is the crucifixion reenacted all over again. Now, you think about that for a minute. The crucifixion reenacted all over again. That kind of sends a cold chill down your spine now, doesn't it? The crucifixion reenacted. Let me remind you of what the Bible has to say about this crucifixion being reenacted. Hebrews 10 12 says this But this man, which man is this? The man there which is being referred to is Christ Jesus. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. You see, Christ died once. I want you to underscore the word once. There is no reenacting Calvary. You see, the same denomination calls it an unbloody sacrifice. That sends a cold, spill, a cold chill down your spine too. An unbloody sacrifice? You know what the Bible has to say concerning that? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In other words, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. I must also point out that in that system, the laity receives only the blood and not the cup. Do you know what the subject of transubstantiation is? It is a pretty big word. It's one of the subjects in this particular religious organization. It is called transubstantiation. You know what it means? Well, what it means is they teach that through some amazing miracle which happens when certain Latin words are uttered by the priest, the bread is transformed into the literal body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that cup is transformed into the literal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the doctrine of transubstanti transubstantiation states that when you partake of the blood and when you partake of the bread, you are literally drinking the blo blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are eating the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't believe me, check it out. That's what they teach. This real presence of Christ means that partakers are eating his literal body. Transubstantiation teaches that the sacrifice of Calvary is repeated with each observance of the Mass and is offered for the sins of the living and is offered for the sins of the dead. But when you read Hebrews chapter 10 and you read verses 10 through 18, it absolutely repudiates and rubbishes this bankrupt idea by stressing that there is only one unrepeated sacrifice for sins never to be offered again. You see, the sacrifice which the Lord Jesus offered is finished and it is complete.
That is why very often you will hear Brother Selwyn Holmes repeatedly state when he prays for the bread or the cup that there is no physical change to either the bread or the wine. If you have wondered why he does that, here, here is the reason why he does that. Now Martin Luther was the great reformer and he simply could not handle this erroneous and heretical doctrine of transubstantiation. And he did not believe that the utterance of some Latin words changed the bread and the wine into the literal body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he came up with another doctrine. It's called consubstantiation. Do you know what that means? This means that the bread and the wine are unchanged. But in a way which cannot be fully explained, the material substance of Christ's body is present and communicated to those who partake. I can assure you no scripture teaches that either. So if you really think about it, there is not too much difference between consubstantiation and transubstantiation. Because simply that is not the teaching of scripture. I in fact call it religious cannibalism. That's what it is. Please allow me to tell you where the mistake comes in. You see, the mistake is that they do not discern the symbolic terms in Scripture. When the Lord Jesus said, This is my body, or when he said, This is my blood, he did not mean it is the literal body or the literal blood. They are symbolic terms in the Word of God, and we have to recognize that. For example, the Lord Jesus said, I am the door. The Lord Jesus did not mean that he was a literal door hanging on hinges that opened and closed. He was using symbolic terms and he was using symbolic language. He was simply teaching, I am the door. I am the entrance. I am the way into heaven and there is no other way. If you ask me, there are two ordinances in the church. Well, then you'll ask me, how do we recognize an ordinance? How is an ordinance ratified? How is an ordinance officially approved as an ordinance? There are two ordinances in the church and the two ordinances are baptism and the Lord's Supper. But then the question is, how do we ratify this? You ratify it by doing a threefold test. Test number one. It has to be instituted by the Lord Jesus in the Gospels. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper were instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Test number two. It has to be practiced by the early church in the book of Acts. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper were practiced by the early church in the book of Acts. Test number three. It has to be explained by the Holy Spirit in the epistles. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper are clearly taught by the Holy Spirit in the epistles. So now you have a threefold combination and there you have an ordinance, don't you? How about foot washing? Some, some assemblies practice foot washing and they call it an ordinance. Let's examine it. Is foot washing an ordinance? Now there are, as I said, there are some groups that practice foot washing. They gather together and they wash each other's feet. That is what they do. But they also call it an ordinance. But do you want to know why it is not an ordinance? It cannot be ratified by the three points we have considered. Was it instituted by the Lord Jesus in the Gospels? Absolutely yes, foot washing was. Was it practiced by the early church in the book of Acts? No, it wasn't. Was it taught by the Holy Spirit in the epistles? It is not. Let us now ask ourselves another question to understand the subject better. What is the message conveyed at the Lord's Supper? You see, the bread and the cup at the Lord's Supper, it has a message for us. It has a message for the born-again Christian believers. If you are not a born-again Christian believer, it has absolutely no message for you. But for the born-again Christian believer, the Lord's Supper, the emblems of the bread and the cup, has a message. One of the lessons we learn is, it is grace, not law. That is what the Lord's Supper speaks to us about. It is the grace of God and not the law. 
the Lord's Supper also speaks to us of redemption accomplished and finished. It speaks to us that our sins have been put away. It tells us that the sting of death is gone and it speaks about eternal glory. Now at the Lord's Supper we remember his death. We remember the one who laid down his life for us, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquity, who died the just for the unjust that he might bring us unto God. The Lord's Supper leads us to Calvary. It leads us to the Word of God. It reminds us that I am a great sinner, but that Christ died to save me from my hopeless estate, and he wiped the slate completely clean. It reminds me that I draw nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance meeting of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This do in remembrance of me. But you see the me there is the person and the person is a lot more than his death. You see it is the person that gives value to the death. It is a remembrance of me and so there it is calling a remembrance of the person. If we only remember his death then the morning meeting as in M-O-R-N-I-N-G this morning meeting will become a morning meeting as in M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. The me there is just something more than his death. It's more than his sufferings. You see, the death speaks of God's love and his holiness. It speaks of atonement made. It speaks of redemption procured. But you see, remembrance is more than just memory. It is an affectionate calling of the person himself to mind. Let me repeat that sentence again. It is an affectionate calling of the person himself to mind. Not only that, we also remember that he rose from the grave and that he lives forevermore and he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. So in short, we remember his life, we remember his death, we remember his resurrection, we remember his ascension, we remember that he now lives in the power of an endless life. We remember that he now lives ever to make intercession for us before God as our advocate. And we remember that he will come again to receive us unto himself. Now let's ask ourselves one other question. What is the procedure to be observed at the Lord's Supper? You see, the Lord Jesus established this remembrance meeting as our principal guide. It seems to have been characterized by sheer and utter simplicity rather than some elaborate ceremony. You see, the Lord Jesus did not specify any fixed rules or procedure. The upper room was not an ornate house of worship. The Lord Jesus alone presided. The elements were simply bread and a cup, two very common elements of the table. In some denominations, you will find that the priest puts on a special multicolored robe. He then lifts the bread and the cup to heaven and he makes some few motions towards heaven, up and down and few motions towards the laity. And they make a great show and make a great spectacle. And they utter some special words and put on a great theatrical effect that mesmerizes the congregation. If you ask me, in Hindi you would call it Gadi Gadi pe drama karta hai. Or, Lord of Drama Bazi is the order of the day. But when we read the scripture, we see that there was no show. And the Lord simply took the elements and gave thanks. The Lord instituted a feast devoid of drama. And it was marked by sheer simplicity. You see, the hymn writer Horatius Bonar said it best when he wrote that timeless hymn. Only bread and only wine, yet to faith the solemn sign of the heavenly and divine. We give thee thanks, O Lord. Till he come, we take the bread, type of him on whom we feed, him who liveth and was dead. We give thee thanks, O Lord. Till he come, we take the cup, 
as we at his table sup i and heart are lifted up we give thee thanks o lord you see no special kind of bread is mandatory although it is very probable that the unleavened bread was used at the time when the lord jesus instituted it you see the stress is laid upon our being spiritually clean as an unleavened when we observe the feast rather than on the kind of bread being used you'll see that in 1 corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 the cup it contained the fruit of the wine you find that in mark 14:25 and matthew 26:29 to what extent this extract was fermented or was mixed with water is a pointless ridiculous and a useless debate scripture is not specific the important thing is that we see that the loaf and the cup typify the blood the body story typify the body and the blood of the lord jesus we are to be occupied with his person and not the nature of the material symbols you see the lord supper takes us back in time 2000 plus years ago when the master broke the bread and gave the cup to his disciples The Lord's Supper was instituted at the Passover Supper. You will find that the Passover Supper commemorated Israel's deliverance from Egypt. The Lord's Supper commemorates our deliverance from the bondage of sin and Satan. When the Lord Jesus performed the Lord's Supper and instituted the Lord's Supper, he performed it in the shadow of Calvary. He was on his way to Calvary when he sat down with his disciples and he gave them the bread and when he gave them the cup he knew what those emblems meant The Lord Jesus tells us that it is the communion of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus That is what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 it is communion So let's ask ourselves the next question what is communion Communion is nothing but intimate fellowship That's what communion is all about. That is what the Lord's Supper is all about. Intimate fellowship. I have fellowship with him because he shed his blood for me. And I have fellowship with him because that blood has redeemed my soul. Now we gather in the name of the living person of the Lord Jesus Christ and not in the name of some religious leader. You have the great apostle paul peter the apostles apollos luther calvin wesley there are a lot of great names there but we don't meet in those names is it possible for christians today to meet in the name of the lord jesus christ alone is that possible i say it is we are not meeting in the name of a religious system we are meeting in the name of a living person and that living person's name is the lord jesus christ The Lord's Supper is also an act of expectation. Why? Because it says till he comes. Christian believers are expecting the Lord Jesus to return. And after the Lord Jesus returns, there will be no more Lord's Supper. As we remember the Lord at the Lord's Supper, it is in appreciation for Calvary, and it is also in anticipation of his coming. Now let me share some good news with you today about these emblems. At nine o'clock today, this morning, we gather together, and the table on the table is the bread and the cup. Now, granted, during the pandemic times, we are not uh, observing that portion of it, but nevertheless, on a regular Sunday morning, we have the bread and the cup. We appreciate those emblems, don't we, as believers? But I've got some good news for you. One day, we are going to exchange those emblems for the person. Aren't you glad? Aren't you looking forward to it? I sure I'm glad and I sure I'm looking forward to it. If you are a born again Christian believer, I sure hope you're looking forward to that day. Some more additional thoughts on the Lord's Supper. It is to be repeated every Lord's Day. Is it to be repeated every Lord's Day? Absolutely yes. Why? Why? Because the answer is lest I forget him. You know it is very possible to get involved in the activities of this life and we could very easily forget about our savior knowing our propensity to forget the lord has very graciously provided this weekly remembrance feast so that we can remember him again and again and again
Let's ask ourselves another question. What is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Well, I can say that it sums up in the word worship. That is what the Lord's Supper is all about. It is worship. That is why the unsaved are differentiated from born-again Christian believers. Every born-again Christian believer is welcome at the Lord's Supper because it is worship. It is praise, not prayer. There is a difference between praise and prayer. The Lord's Supper is not the place where you pray for Aunt Jemima. Incidentally, Aunt Jemima is a very famous brand of maple syrup which you get in the United States. That's why I use that word, Aunt Jemima. You see, the Lord's Supper is not the place where you pray for Aunt Jemima who is in the hospital. Now you certainly, please don't get me wrong, you certainly should pray for Aunt Jemima in the hospital. But it wouldn't be appropriate to pray for Aunt Jemima at the Lord's Supper. That is, the Lord's Supper is not the time for personal prayer. It is praise. And this praise is not measured by eloquence or by the length of your prayer. That is not the way you measure it. It is measured by depth, as in spiritual depth. Now, I heard about this young brother who had recently got saved. He was prospering in his spiritual life and he was growing in grace and he was very involved in the study of the word of God. One day an older believer said to him, I notice that you never take part audibly at the Lord's Supper. Why don't you take part? He asked him. You know what his answer was? He said, I haven't learned or conquered the King James language. You see, the older Christians were praying in the King James language. You know, the thee and the thou and the thy and, the, and all these words. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God understands Chennai English or Icelandic English or Greenland's English? He certainly does. So today I would encourage the young brother, brothers, I implore you. Don't let the King James language interfere with your opportunity to share in the things of God. You see, the other day, young Jonathan prayed a very short and very simple prayer. It was a couple of Sundays ago. And it had everything the Lord truly appreciates. It came from the very depths of his heart. And it sure means more than a prayer that quotes back to God some scriptural verses from the Bible that has been memorized. You see, this is several years ago. My son gave me a birthday card. It was not even a birthday card. It was that he had uh, drawn up a Formula One car. And um, he was so into cars at that time. And he had drawn up a Formula One car with two, a two-seater Formula One car. And he, it had him and me in that car. And on that, he wrote some very heartfelt words about how much he loved me and appreciated me. Those were words which came from his heart. It was not some lines which he had copied from some other birthday card. It was not even a proper birthday card. It was a, a self-designed card. You see, it did not have any great prose or anything like that. But if you ask me in my life, that was the most precious birthday card I ever received. Why? Because it came right from his heart. So too it is with our Heavenly Father. He values our heartfelt adoration more than us simply quoting some verses from the King James Version back to him. Let your praise come from the depth of your heart. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is also not to do a sing-along of favorite songs. That is not what the Lord's Supper is all about. So let me qualify that statement. What I meant is the Lord's Supper is not a sing-along because we don't sing for the fun of it. The Lord's Supper is not the place where you sing jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way or some other melodious tune. That is not the reason we sing at the Lord's Supper. We sing at the Lord's Supper for the glory of God. But you might have noticed that quite often at the Lord's Supper there is a theme that follows. And this theme that follows from the very first hymn that is sung to the last Amen at the Lord's Supper. And you will find that there is a very beautiful theme. As I took part more and more in the Lord's Supper as a youngster, I recognized this theme. And I started recognizing this theme running through the Lord's Supper. I thought it was simply beautiful. But sometimes I couldn't recognize the theme. 
For the longest time, I thought that the theme was the first prominent word in the first line of the first hymn or the first prayer that was uttered. The first words of the first hymn they sang and that became the theme. If it happened to be love, then love would become the theme. If it happened to be redemption, then redemption would be the theme. But recently, I have changed my opinion on that and I don't believe in that anymore. Let me let me put it in the form of a practical example. What happens if someone gave out this hymn, very first hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching As To War? Now if I think onward or the word Christian or the word soldier should be the theme and if everyone got, is getting up started on that tangent, then we might have a very awkward combobulation and amalgamation of various disjointed thoughts. That led me to firmly believe that that is not the way you should be choosing the theme of the Lord's Supper. So then the automatic question which we need to ask is, then how should the theme be decided? What should be the theme of the Lord's Supper? There's a very simple answer for that. The theme of every Lord's Supper is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that again. The theme of every Lord's Supper is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other theme. The circumstances under which the Lord's Supper was instituted was under the shadows of Calvary. I had already mentioned that. That night in which he was betrayed was when the Lord's Supper was instituted. So then coming back to this question, when should the Lord's Supper be observed? The answer is the first day of the week. Next question, why the first day of the week? Well, first of all, because of its importance. Because the first day speaks of a living Savior. And because the first day speaks of the New Testament, the new covenant of grace. Also, we must pay special attention to the pattern the Lord established. Scripture says that the Lord Jesus broke bread on the first day with his disciples. And then we read in the book of Acts that the Christians, the disciples, broke bread on the first day of the week. And we read and understand that the early church kept the observance once a week at the center of their gatherings. You find that in Acts 27. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, for what purpose did they come together? To break bread. So we have a clear scriptural pattern established which the church continues to follow faithfully to this day. It was celebrated on the day of resurrection. Revelation 1.10 calls it the Lord's Day. The first day is an important day because it speaks of a living Savior. Acts 27 also says that Paul preached unto them. So we see that the Lord's Supper was accompanied by a ministry message from the Apostle Paul. Just as this institution, the very first supper was accompanied by ministry from the Lord. That was the pattern followed by the early church. And this happened about 25 years after Pentecost. The pattern was to have the Lord's Supper weekly on the Lord's Day. Now let me ask you a question. Does our church observe the Lord's Supper weekly and follow that with a word of ministry? Yes, it does. So we can safely say that our church is scripturally correct in this matter. Now faith in the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a place at the Lord's Supper. If you are a born-again Christian believer, you are not only welcome to the Lord's Supper, but you must make it a point to be at the Lord's Supper. Now, there should be confession which should be taking place before taking part in the Lord's Supper. But let me ask you this question. When should that confession take place? The answer is certainly not at the Lord's Supper. You see, the confession should take place long before you arrive at the Lord's Supper. Let's ask ourselves another question. What about preparation for the Lord's Supper? What is the appropriate preparation one must make before taking part in the Lord's Supper? If you ask me, preparation for the Lord's Supper must include one, self-examination. 
You see, true ex preparation for the Lord's Supper begins with a self-examination. You find that in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 32, where we are asked to examine ourselves. One should first examine his own relationship with the Lord and confess any known sin. Then he should look at his relationship with others, especially other Christians. An attempt should be made to settle problems with other believers before taking part in the feast. You find that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. The scriptures also warn us against neglect in the area of self-judgment, lest God's judgment come upon us. In the church of Corinth, you find that physical illness and sometimes death resulted by, from believers being careless in this area. A second thing which needs to happen in preparation for the Lord's Supper is meditation. Now, if we have been entertaining ourselves recreationally and conversing in subjects not directly related to the Lord before coming to the feast, our preparation has failed. If you ask me, reading the word of God, singing spiritual songs and sharing with other believers or family members about the Lord Jesus are some of the ways in which you can spend time in preparation for remembering him. Certainly, we can only bring to him that which has been prepared ahead of time. Celebration of the Lord's Supper will be freed from deadness and sameness when we have prepared ourselves beforehand. Now, those of you who are born again Christian believers should arrive at your Lord's Supper, at the Lord's Supper with your basket full, full of spiritual fruit that you can offer unto the Lord. Let's ask ourselves an, a, another question. When do you gather that spiritual fruit that you can offer at the Lord's Supper? You see, that spiritual fruit is certainly not gathered at the Sunday morning breakfast table when you're sipping your cappuccino and munching on a croissant sandwich. That is not the time you gather spiritual fruit to share at the Lord's Supper. Your basket, if you ask me, is filled throughout the week, every day. And every day when you have your daily devotions and read a portion from the scriptures, as you continue in prayer, you keep filling the basket and eventually you will be prepared to share it at the Lord's Supper if an opportunity arises. It is an act of obedience and a responsibility on our part to observe the Lord's Supper. The Lord's command was this do in remembrance of me. If you ask me, that is a command directly from the Lord Jesus. It is an actual act of mutual communion. I have communion with the Lord. The Lord has communion with me. And we have communion with each other. Let me ask ourselves another question. What excuse do we have for not being at the Lord's Supper? Now again, I'm talking about Christian believers. I wouldn't say this to someone that is not a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are a true born-again Christian believer, what excuse do we have for not being at the Lord's Supper? Can you think of an excuse? Well, I can think of a few. How about the intensive care, in the, uh, intensive care unit in the hospital? That's, that's a good one. The current pandemic where you are taking sensible precautions, especially if you are in the high-risk category, or if you have a communicable fever or disease that could be easily spread to others, by your attending the Lord's Supper. Those are all sensible excuses to not take part in the Lord's Supper. You see, worship is the supreme responsibility and privilege of the believer. Regularly remembering the Lord as he commanded should take precedence over recreational activities or family gatherings or other obligations. In the United States, I've often found that many meetings takes place on the golf course on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Missing the Lord's Supper for a round of golf hardly seems like a reasonable excuse. You see, if you're a born-again Christian believer, your appreciation of the Lord's Supper is going to measure your spiritual commitment to the Lord. Do you honestly believe that? It measures your spiritual commitment to the Lord. I want to go to the next uh, topic, which is etiquette at the Lord's Supper. Let's address this question of coming late. 
You see, it is not good to come late. Why? Because we are rarely late for an important work meeting. Now again, this is a personal point of view, not one I can show from scripture. I listened to an exhortation by a great man of God at another assembly. And what he said certainly pricked me. He told at that assembly, take your seat during a break. In other words, if you come late, do not just stroll in, in the middle of a song or in the middle of somebody praying or in somebody is giving a sharing a thought from the word of God. Do not come in the middle. Take your seat during a break. Stand outside. Wait for the break. The fault of being late. Whose fault was that? It was your fault. Others shouldn't have to pay for your tardiness. You see, oftentimes people take the edge seats, moving of chairs, creating a noise, trying to get a seat, making others get up and disturbing the whole congregation, disturbing the train of thought while a prayer is going on or a table thought is being uttered, are all simply wrong. Have I personally been late? Yes, I have been late. Have I been guilty of entering while a prayer or a thought was being shared? Absolutely, yes, I have done that. And I did that in ignorance because I did not know any better. And I had seen people doing that all my life, so I also did that. No one had taught me until this servant of God had taught me on that Sunday morning. I learned from that advice. And the next time I was late, I stood outside. And during that time, I started self-introspecting myself as to why I had been late. And I never wanted to be late ever again. Yes, there might be times when things are out of our control and we are late, but we can at least have the courtesy to our fellow believers to not disturb them if we are late and wait for a break. Let me ask you this. You all have been to classes, either at the university level or at the college level. Will any of those professors allow latecomers to walk in when you please like, when you feel like, and you just walk in and you kick up your feet and listen to a lecture? Worldly professors certainly do not allow this. Why should the Lord's Supper be any different? If you come late, wait outside till the prayer or the table thought is over and then enter and take your seat. That is being considerate of others. It is best never to be late. It is best to arrive early and spend a few minutes in meditation before the meeting actually begins. A second thing which I found is very often I have found that people get up even before the other brother has sat down. You should allow for a pause. Now in scripture you will find, especially when you read the Psalms, you will find the word Selah. The word Selah means there. What do you think about that? The Psalmist often uses the word Selah. There. What do you think about what has just been stated? Think on it. Muse on it. Meditate on it. In music, I'm not a musician, but in music there is something called a rest symbol. And if you read music, you will find that these rest symbols are placed at the appropriate places. And if that rest symbol is not there and you do not rest, the music loses its utter value. So too, in our worship, there should be a pause at a remembrance meeting. And we want to just take a moment to consider what has been said by the brother before. Simply saying, in continuation to the thought expressed, fools no one. Getting up too fast only signals to others your desperation and often ends up with others tuning out. I can give you a case in point. A brother had borrowed a beautiful thought from the tabernacle. And even before he could take his seat, the next brother was already up saying in continuation with the thought. He had not even taken a seat. I was still thinking about the thought which the brother had offered and I did not listen to the first uh, few minutes because I had utterly tuned that person out. Another thing which I can think of is don't be too casual. I personally have seen a great conference speaker and that conference speaker was also an elder in an assembly. Now his son happened to come to the assembly where I was attending. <clears throat> 
And I, one fine day I found that he was sitting in the seat behind me. And there he was drinking a Tim Hortons coffee while the worship was going on. Yep, I have seen it all. Now I used that occasion to teach my son what was wrong about it and I used that as a teaching moment. The right thing to do is to approach the meeting with reverence because you are in the presence of the King of Kings and you are there to worship him before whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. As believers, we are not to treat it lightly or to habitually neglect it. We ought to have an attitude of reverence. I also want to say that there is a difference between the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it mentions the bread and the wine. In 1 Corinthians 10.21, it is called the Lord's tab table. When 1 Corinthians 11, again you have the bread and the wine mentioned, and but the 1 Corinthians 11.20 calls it the Lord's Supper. So the automatic question to be asked is, is there a difference between the Lord's Supper and the Lord's table? The answer is, yes, there is a big difference. If you go back and read about it, you'll find that in 1 Corinthians 10, the cup is mentioned first and then comes the bread. In 1 Corinthians 11, you'll find that the bread is mentioned first, then comes the cup. You see, clearly the Holy Spirit did not make a mistake in reversing the order. And for the longest time, I used to wonder why this pattern was reversed. But one day, Brother Manika was almost taking a Bible study on a Wednesday night. And I remember him telling about 1 Corinthians 10 being the Lord's table and 1 Corinthians 11 being the Lord's Supper. He didn't go into too much details on that day and I didn't fully grasp it. But today I have a better grasp of it. And in fact, before this uh, message, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to him personally about it and I am 100% in agreement with him. Brother William MacDonald and other scholars also say that there is a difference between the Lord's Table and the Lord's Supper. But I must say that William MacDonald's commentary is not as detailed as I would have liked it. But the key point to remember is on Sunday morning we worship the Lord and it is the Lord's Supper that we observe. Now those who are interested would be more than welcome to go and pick Brother Manik Wasim's scholarly mind to get a better education because simply reading the William MacDonald commentary is not getting, going to get you the true insight on the subject. But I honestly 100% agree with Brother Manika Wasam and uh, I just do not have the time to fit it in in today's message. In closing, it is the privilege of every believer to come on the appointed day and in the appointed way to show forth the death of our Lord Jesus Christ to show forth that the Lord Jesus Christ was our sacrifice and to acknowledge him as our savior. To remember that the Lord Jesus Christ who is alive forevermore as our Lord and our head. That we are going to be waiting patiently for Christ our hope into whose image we shall be transformed and in whose presence we shall dwell forever and ever. I have lots more to say on this subject but this would be a good time to stop. So let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for instituting the Lord's Supper and we thank Thee for the example of observing the Lord's Supper which is mentioned in the book of Acts. We thank Thee for the instruction that You have given to us in the epistles concerning the wonderful feast of remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, if there is someone here who is not a born-again Christian believer, we pray that they would not leave until they make that decision to repent of their sin and to, leave and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And then that they would sincerely desire to remember the Lord at the Lord's Supper. We pray this in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.